All right, so it's now time to ask Thomas Holderness come to give his speech about the cog in the machine. So, this is awesome. Um, and how's the audio? Good? Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah, my name is Thomas. Um, I uh, work at Address Cloud, and I lead the technical development of our solution. And I'm here to talk uh, today about cloud optimized geotiffs. Um, and how we're using them, which is a little bit different to some of the other use cases that we've seen. Um, and so great to see so many talks about COGS at this uh, FOS4G. So really briefly in one slide, um, Address Cloud provides uh, geocoding and risk intelligence um, for um, businesses around the world, um, primarily in the financial sector. And we work with a lot of insurers um, so that we can tell insurers how risky a property may be um, for underwriting purposes. Um, as our, our, one of our key markets, and then we also work um, with commercial markets with, um, for deliveries and logistics. So today I'm going to focus on the use case of um, risk profiling. So this is our maps application. And uh, in this scenario, an insurer has, um, has dropped a pin on the map um, and has turned some information on that we have um, from a data vendor about um, flooding and flood severity. And we can see that this, this location, which doesn't have an address, it's a greenfield site. Um, so we, we're not, we, we know where it is geographically, but we haven't got an address um, attached to that location. That location has a really high um, flood risk, so we can see it's got, it's got a really, really high flood score. So an insurer will be very unlikely to want to write um, that location. Now, of course, we've got um, awesome data from our data providers um, about, about flooding, uh, about um, subsidence, about um, windstorm, about um, tree, uh, trees nearby, and then intelligence about um, the building itself. Obviously, that's a large amount of data in our back end, so we need to be able to query that information uh, really very effectively and very, very quickly um, so that we can tell that insurer in almost no time at all um, what the risk is like to be at that property. And so all of the processes that we do are API-led, so that's our maps application, but we have um, an API um, that, that that application is built on, but also some of our customers connect to. Uh, and the documentation is available, docs.addresscloud.com, if you're um, interested in the things that we do and the, the kinds of data sets that we bring together. Um, and so we work um, with lots of different data partners that have varying data requirements. But obviously, most GIS data comes in one of two flavors, as we all know, vector and raster. And so we have an internal process of taking all of those data sets together um, and pulling them into our back end, into our service, uh, and then um, allowing people to query that service for some information. Um, but those data sets are getting bigger because increasingly the resolution of the data sets is improving. We now have um, digital surface models in the UK down to five meters. So that's the resolution of the flood model. I'll talk more about that um, in a second. And when um, some of our clients connect to our system, um, they may be competing in real time against other uh, vendors. So in the UK, we have aggregate, aggregator websites. So if you go to get your house insurance or your car insurance, um, you may then uh, go to compare the market, for example, and you see a range of prices that are coming back to you in real time. So uh, when that happens, and uh, an insurer asks us to tell, tell them about the risk at that point in, in space, we need to be able to respond to them very, very quickly, typically um, sub one second. Um, and that keeps me really busy, because I have to be able to think about how do I do GIS with really big data that's at really good resolutions, but I have to do it really, really, really quickly, and that's, that's, my, that's my day job. That's what I do. Um, I should also give a kind of really big thanks, because this presentation is an extension um, of some work uh, that I first presented at Geomob in London, which is a, a really great event. I think there's now one in Berlin as well. So um, if you're in either of those two locations, that's a really nice crowd of people to come and hang out with and, and talk about geo things. So in the beginning, there was the database. And of course, it was PostGIS, because um, we all love PostGIS, and PostGIS is awesome. Um, and we, you know, we have a big post just back end um, to, to pull all those data sets together and do the spatial analysis that we need. So we had an application 
have an architecture that looks like this. So we have a database, that's where all the data is. We have an application that we've written that combines or queries all that data, and then we have an API or an application at the front. You're sure most people in the room that have done some um, spatial development will be kind of familiar with this, this kind of architecture. So this is um, a bit of an overview of one of the types of data sets that we've got from one of our data providers that does flood data. So they're providing us with this um, flood model, um, which is, uh, as I said, at a five meter resolution. So it's 24 billion pixels um, just of the land cover. Once you've masked out the other 30 billion pixels that are just um, the ocean, which obviously we're not bothered about. Um, and the, the sort of the, um, if you think um, from a remote sensing background, you might think about radiometric depths as actually 52 different layers um, of potential information for every pixel in that data set. Um, so it's quite, quite a lot of information. Um, and as I said before, um, we have quite strict um, SLAs with lots of our um, customers where we have to basically provide them that information, but only a subset of it, not the entire data set. We have to be able to query it and say, for this small parcel of land, this is uh, what we can tell you in terms of the flood risk. Um, and so then, that's great, but then what if we want to do other countries like North America? Um, it's like, oh man, like our, uh, our PostGIS database bill is gonna get really big um, to be able to like scale that, um, ingesting this stuff with PostGIS raster, being able to query it in real time. Um, I should mention that everything's cached um, anyway, but we often have use cases where we can't cache because um, it's a greenfield site, so we don't know in advance what that, that area, that location is gonna be. So um, what can we do? Um, and at the same time, it's been, uh, put this in because um, there's lots of talk about what was happening in the future of PostGIS raster and where that was going to go and it's been factored out into a separate extension so it was really good to get some updates this morning and see that that project has um, been factored out but still kind of part, core part of PostGIS is, and is continuing. But for us it was kind of a time of, well, do we need to look at other solutions? Um, how are we going to make this thing, this thing work? Um, and luckily, I was at FOS4G. Um, and it was a chap called Alex Leith uh, who is here. Um, and I think it's just given a presentation who um, was talking about um, geo packages and mentioned this thing called COGS. And that was the first time I'd heard of a, a cloud optimized geo tiff. Uh, um, and I was like, wrote, made some notes in my notebook diligently, I thought, and then filed that away. And then a few months later, facing this problem, and I was like, is this, there's some new raster specification now? Where did I hear about that? Oh, yeah, FOS4G. So enter the cloud optimized GeoTIFF, and I'm, I'm really pleased that I hope lots of you have been to some of the other cloud optimized GeoTIFF talks because um, there were some brilliant ones that give uh, really good details about how a, um, a cog and the TIFF file and under the hood uh, works. So that I don't need to don't need to cover that information um, directly myself. But really quickly, you can say you know cloud optimized GeoTIFF is just a way of internally tiling um, the TIFF information, um, and it's accessible over the web. So it's a cloud first um, data product. So that means you can say for this bounding box, just give me those pixel values. And for us, that's amazing, because that starts to transform the TIFF file into a queryable, searchable database. If you can say, okay, I, I want this area, I just want this small handful of pixels, I don't need the other 28 billion, just give me the values for those. So, not, not too much code, I hope, you can, hope that's fairly legible. Um, we can actually use the brilliant Raster.io library that um, is created by Mapbox um, to directly interact um, with our cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. So I can step you through this. This is um, the only lines of code that I'm going to show, but so we're going to import um, Raster.io um, in Python. And then this, this is the magic. This is where I realized that this thing for us was going to be like gold because I can put my cloud-optimized GeoTIFF file in uh, what's called an S3 bucket, which is an object store from Amazon Web Services and I can make a connection to that file in that bucket across the internet, so I don't need my compute to be in the same location as my data store. And then the second bit of magic is I can say, I've got some, co I've got some coordinates, some geographical space, give me the pixel values that fall within that space, and I can do that straight directly to the S3 bucket. Um, brilliant, uh, great, now I've, got, now I've got maybe 10 pixels coming back, which is a very small amount of data, and it's happening quite quickly. Um, and I don't need to start to worry about this. I'm not worrying about the size of my, um, my GeoTIFF. One of the other sort of constraints of using PostGIS raster, is, which, which is a kind of a, um, previous version of this, was that our ETL process was getting longer and longer as our data sets were getting bigger, uh, more data sets, uh, larger areas. 
more areas of the world. Um, and so that was one of the problems that we, we faced there. In this version, because the data provider provides a raster data set as a TIFF file, it's actually quite an easy um, and uh, uh, simple process to convert that existing GeoTIFF into a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. Lastly, I can read those, read those pixels out and I can send them back to my API um, so I can continue the process. Brilliant. So now we've kind of got some pieces on the board in front of us. Um, start to put these things together. We've got our data in a bucket. We can access that. Uh, we know that we can um, pull that through to the API. What are we going to do in the middle? Um, well, we are address cloud. So everything that we do is, is in the cloud, is cloud native. Um, our service this year will be 100% um, serverless um, to support our scalability. So the natural choice for us was to um, use another Amazon Web Services product called AWS, AWS Lambda. Um, and Lambda is um, a piece of technology that allows you to upload some code that you've written that is executed uh, in response to a function and can execute as many of them in parallel as you want, so it's completely scalable. Um, and when that, when that function is finished running, it shuts down, so you only pay for the time that it runs. Typically, um, you may run that code for maybe one to two seconds. Fantastic. So we can drop AWS Lambda in the middle. We've got our data store at the back end. Um, the data storage costs of an object store like Amazon S3 mean that even that um, file, which is many, many gigabytes, doesn't really cost us anything to store. Our AWS Lambda function um, doesn't really cost us anything to run. Um, and we use another uh, bit of kit from, it, from Amazon called API Gateway that provides our API. Um, and that doesn't really cost us anything uh, either for this, this uh, particular part of the architecture. So all of a sudden, we've gone from what was um, becoming quite a big challenge, manual process of loading data into PostGIS and then making sure that our PostGIS databases were able to scale with, um, in real time with our uh, users' um, low latency but um, high number of connections into something which um, scales effortlessly and um, is, is very, very cheap, which is great. Um, there is a little bit of um, learning, there's a bit of learning curve to get the Rast.io package to work in AWS Lambda. Now, thankfully, Mapbox was around again. Um, and they, they did a blog post, a brilliant blog post, that talked about how to take um, the Rast.io package and some of the underlying um, bits of GDAL and other bits and, and put, basically use a Docker image um, that's released by Amazon to, to compile those things from scratch and get rid of a lot of the things that you don't need in there, like the documentation files, get rid of all of that, really slim that thing down. Um, and the, there's a, there's a, we've got a Lambda layer that means that anyone can, um, can get this now and upload that as a, basically a series of compiled um, Python files. Um, so and this is on GitHub, anyone can start using it with the example that I showed to start playing, kind of playing around. Um, and the service time was brilliant. So um, we, did, we did tests. This is 100 um, simultaneous requests for, um, for different areas um, of, one, um, of that one really big raster. Um, so those requests are all coming into the service at the same time. And the, the mean time was um, 74 milliseconds. And the standard distribution, standard deviation, sorry, is uh, 20 milliseconds. So we're really happy with that because it means that we can be, we can be hitting that service and as much as we want. And we can, it's just going to do that all day. It's just going to keep giving you back those pixels for as, um, as long as you want. Uh, and so our overall um, status continued to be the same. We're doing some, uh, some performance testing at the moment, so I'm excited to see what happens when we start to scale this um, more than 100 requests, when we um, continually uh, hit this, maybe th like a soak test, um, where you're doing thousands of requests over uh, a couple of days. I'll be, be uh, hopefully writing slash presenting about that in the future. So I kind of wanted to finish on a bit of a use case to, to put this in, really kind of give an example, show some maps, I guess. Um, this is a great um, use case of our application and the stuff that we're doing with COGS. So this is a caravan park, uh, and it's my colleague Mark. Uh, it's near where he used to go on holiday when he was a little boy, at the seaside um, in England. And so if we do um, a geocode on uh, the address for that caravan park, the postal address where the, where the mail goes is, um, is this, the, the, the red pin. You can't really see it, but it's the, the front door, the main office, the building that's bricks and mortar. But the risk to the insurer is obviously all of the caravans um, across the entire site. So the flood risk for the main building, for the office where the post is delivered, uh, is one, so very low. Nah, I, yeah, I would, I would think about writing that as an insurer. But the insurer is actually insuring all of those caravans. They're doing the site. They're insuring the whole site. So what can we do? Well, we can allow our insurer to come to our Maps application and draw a custom freehand polygon around that site and say, I'm underwriting this, these caravans, or this segment, or the full site. And if we turn on the flood layers, 
we actually see that that, um, that, that area as a whole has got a very, very high um, level of potential flooding. And so it probably isn't such a good thing to, to want to underwrite. Um, and we've got that flood score that's come back on the left that's come back at 30. That is a calculation that's been done by polling all of the pixels that are in, in, that, in that cloud optimized GeoTIFF and adding the flood score together to get, uh, and normalizing it um, to give you a value. And so that's all, that, can all, that all happens in, in real time um, querying. And then we can also visualize that by, um, we, we actually convert our cloud optimized GeoTIFF um, into a stylized representation um, using some vector tiles um, so that actually you can turn that on as a layer and you can see, okay, there's a river running through that site. So happily, it was quicker than I expected. Um, I've written a, a blog post that dives into some of the details about this at blog.addresscloud.com, so you can, you can check that out. Um, and that's it. I, uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. It's towards the end of the session on the last day. Um, I've had a really good conference, and it was really great to meet all of you, and I hope to meet a few more this afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Here. Okay. Um, you previously said that you plan or you moved to Lambda. Uh, is there a reason why you did this? Because it now looks like you are tied to um, Amazon. Uh, yeah, so we um, were already using Amazon Web Services to um, deliver, deliver our services. So um, we already using it, so it was made, made sense for us to use their technology to, to um, provide this service. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah? You, got, you want to, you got another question? Not really, but yeah. If you, I was curious if you really want to use Amazon. And if, if you want to move to Google Cloud, for example, I think now it's quite hard for you. So I'm curious why you, take, uh, you took this decision. Uh, yeah, because at the time when we started working on um, not this service, but other services that use the same technology, Amazon was the only solution provider that provided the solution. Um, yeah, vendor lock-in with a cloud provider is an interesting challenge. Uh, one of the things that we're done, doing at the moment is uh, using another um, piece of uh, tooling called Terraform that allows us to um, basically uh, infrastructure as code so we can code out our infrastructure. So that helps because that supports lots of different cloud Cloud services back end, but we would have to do it, would be a really, really, a reasonably major refactor to, to move some of this stuff over. Um, there's some really great initiatives in that space. Um, there's like open function as a service, and so um, what I would hope is that over time, uh, we're using AWS Lambda, but that might s start to support an open standard, um, and that we could take, could take advantage of that. Yeah, um, thanks. Any other questions? Sure, yeah. Um, what's your like, wish list for the open source geospatial community? What would you like them working on? Oh, wow. Um, so I really wish I'd like, written a list of things I'd like you all to work on, uh, ready for next year. Um, I've written a list of things I'd like you all to work on, ready for next year. At the end of a FOS4G conference. So the question was, what would, what's my wish list for the open source uh, geospatial uh, community? Um, I think uh, cloud optimized geotiffs and the tooling that's been or is emerging around them, a really good example of thinking about geospatial data in a, in a serverless environment, in a cloud-first environment. And I'd like to see that continue, um, because um, the architecture that we have is not, uh, you, you, you could not replicate it with um, a more traditional server-based model. Um, we would not be able to provide the service that we do with the latencies that we have, um, with the number of users that we have, um, with, with our, uh, an enormously large number of physical machines, and even then, um, it, I think it would cause problems. So continuing to talk, and FOS4G is one such venue, and there's other, other good conversations going on in the community, both online and in person, about how we um, continue to move geospatial tech in, into the cloud, and also how we continue to embrace our you know, open source-ness, uh, our open source ethos, and take that with us and start to challenge some of the things about, well, why can't I run my functions in different cloud providers? Um, you know, is, is the underlying technology open? Any other questions? Hmm? Thanks, Mark. Not, not, not. It's not a curveball. 
No, not a question as such. It's just um, just going on to the, the um, you know, kind of continuing from what Tom was saying around the um, like vendor lock-in. I've heard that. I've kind of heard that in the past about vendor lock-in. I think well, there's two things. I think one, um, I think if you try to be cloud agnostic or multi-cloud, I think you miss the point and you miss most of the benefits you'd get from a particular cloud if you kind of really, really sort of have that layer of, of a level of abstraction. And then the other thing as well, I don't think you lock yourself in with Lambda. Or you, you, in effect, you simplify your code down to some Python or some JavaScript. And actually, the bits that make it Lambda or Google Functions or Azure are so minimal that actually the rewrite to move from one to the other would be, would be quite small. Mm. And then you can always use things like, yeah, I mean, we didn't really get on with the serverless framework, but you can use abstractions like Service Frame or, ter or Terraform, as, as, as Tom mentioned, to kind of take that away. So yeah, don't, don't, I think don't be, don't be scared about going all in on one cloud. Um, I think to move to another one would not be a massive, massive issue, I don't think. Brilliant. It's really hard to see you. It's just bright lights shining down. Um, so wave. Are we done? Any oh, one more last one questions? at the back. Yes. yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, can, you, can you please repeat the, the question? Sorry, yes, repeat the question. The question was, uh, there have been lots of talks about um, big GeoTIFFs and cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs in the browser uh, and, and tool sets such as GeoTIFF.js that have been presented this week. Do I see an opportunity there to, to work with that code in the back end? I think that was the question. Um, uh, yeah, so first I would say we're not, we're not rendering clogs, cogs on the client. Um, we're using them as, as for us, it's a back-end data store and queryable thing. The GeoTIFF JS library does look really good and it runs in Node, so it could run on the back end. So I'm quite interested to performance test it against the stuff that we've done in Python. Um, the biggest problem that we have at the moment is um, compatibility to some of the lower level binaries stuff that's going on in Python and getting that uh, updated so that uh, GeoTIFF JS, for example, is a pure uh, JavaScript implementation, so if we could use that um, instead, that might be that might be really good. So, um, and in, in terms of tiling, yeah, I don't know. I've not we've not I've not experimented with looking at stuff on the on the front end. So, um, be interesting to see where that where all that kind of space goes. Any more questions? We do have time. All right. So the question was for indices or classifications, would they happen on the browser or server side? Um, uh, I think it depends you know, on the use case. I think there's some brilliant examples of doing stuff on the client, um, but for us, we, everything's API backed, so we need to be able to push out that data, that classification or whatever it is through our API. So that's why we're interested in you know, what can we do in the back end, um, because we wouldn't want to replicate something where we have one process in our front end client that's not available through the API. Um, so we're, you know we're API-led with as many customers using an API as we do having using the front-end tooling. So I, I really think it depends on the use case um, and what you want to achieve with that data. I think the examples that I've showed here um, are quite different to some of the other examples. Lots of most examples I've seen of Cogs are um, of RGB imagery, um, and so that's obviously that's a completely different use case where we've got you know a synthetic product um, that, that's just using GeoTIFF as its storage mechanism. Um, but it's not, it's, it doesn't, wouldn't have to, it doesn't have to be an image, for example. Um, but that's because it's a continuous surface data product. That's the, the best way currently to store it. Thanks. All right, we have more questions. Just give me one minute. Hope you've got your Fitbit on. <laughs> then there's steps up. <laughs> sorry, it's Wranglers. <laughs> So my question is, um, you, you said you've got like uh, the coverage of whole whole UK in, is it really one image? Is it really a 200 gigabyte uh, cock? Yep. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, didn't, I didn't say that when it first came from the data provider. Yeah. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yep, and I, oh, here it is. So that, that works with the performance you've shown, so that's really impressive and 
Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so I would, again, I was like, oh, we just try it out. Oh, that's kind of fast. Yep, that works. Because originally, you know, we'd go into this big ETL process of chopping it up and putting it in. And um, uh, yeah, it seems to be it, it, in that back end environment. We do do some stuff um, around caching the connection. So we're making sure that we've always got all, that data is always warm, as it's, as it's called, so that the access to the data in the bucket and that the code that, that um, queries that data is that those things are always ready to go. Yeah. Um, that that helps quite a lot. Um, but yeah, it's it seems. I'm yeah, I'm really impressed that the, whatever the magic is, and I probably have people in the audience to thank that have contributed to that specific the cog specification. The magic that's in there is um, is pretty phenomenal from our perspective. Yeah. We do have time for one more, for one more question. And I need the exercise, so. <laughs> Along the same line as the question uh, that was already, the comment that was already asked, do you foresee, like you've got a 200 gigabyte image in there, do you foresee issues with larger images or some sort of performance drop off or something like that? Or do you think it would be linear in terms of the performance? Yeah, I wouldn't want to quote absolute, so I don't know, but I can see that it's, it's probably not going, to be, it's not going to be scalable to say like North America. Um, so we're going to, we're going to, you know, we have to start to think about what we do there, but I'd be interested to ask, well, so for example, I know that the data provider is doing it in North America is doing it on a state basis. So provide you with it, or, or, or what you loosely call a region, um, because I think you, they, they would run into problems creating the input data, you know, their output data that we're taking in. They'd have problems creating, getting their flood model to, to, to fit within that you know, um, continuous surface. So then I think then there's some interesting things about what do we do. Do we take all of those and then tile them? Um, so I we don't know yet. That's something that we're going to be working on this year. Yeah. Yep. So um, the question was, um, Amazon Lambdas um, have a startup time of, of one or two or even longer uh, number of seconds. Um, how do we deal with that? So we're always within SLA. Um, we deal with that by making sure that uh, so our monitoring service, our internal monitoring service, is, or is continuously polling our service to make sure that um, the the sandbox worker, which is the, the piece of infrastructure that Amazon has that checks out that Lambda code and um, runs it to make sure that the sandbox worker is always um, around and, and, and kind of listening. Um, and that those can persist for a, um, for over the course of a day. That, that same worker would persist, so, so say Amazon. Um, and so if that thing's always around, then it, um, your, the, the startup time decreases. And so they have this concept, it, it, the terminology is a cold start uh, and, a, and a warm start. Um, and so if you the figures that I show and uh, when our uh, customers um, connect to us and, and make a query, they're, they're hitting lambdas which are warm already. So their startup time is drastically reduced. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks. Cheers.